Jackie Sullivan is a, a, a colleague here at Western, uh, and she's going to be speaking as, to us today about coordinated pluralism and cumulative heroes. Let's welcome Jackie. Thanks very much, and thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so what I'm going to do today um, is the following. I'll briefly introduce the area of neuroscience that is the focus of my talk. I'll put forward what it, I consider a partial set of conceptual tools for thinking about knowledge production in this area of science. I'll use the tools to critically analyze two representative case studies from this area of neuroscience, and then I'm going to synthesize the fruits of this analysis into a positive proposal for cumulative neuroscience, identify some outstanding questions, and conclude. So the area of neuroscience I'm interested in is cognitive neurobiology, which is roughly the area of neuroscience that investigates the mechanisms of cognitive functions, cognitive functions including such things as spatial recognition, working memory, and attention, to name only a few, and disruptions in these functions in non-human animals. The basic investigative strategy in this area of neuroscience is as follows. You select an animal model. The experiments that I'll be talking about today are rodent experiments. Um, you then select a form of learning and an experimental learning paradigm or task to produce, detect, and measure that form of learning in the laboratory. And then you select an intervention technique and intervene in the activity of the brain area, neuronal population, synapse, molecule, or gene that you're of interest to determine the impact on behavior. Um, and these are just a variety of different intervention techniques, including lesioning, um, cannula insertion, IP injection, optogenetic techniques, and gene knockout. And I'll, gene knockouts, I'll talk about a few of those during the talk. So using this investigative strategy, if you notice that the relevant behavioral differences between control and experimental groups that you're investigating um, in the lab when they're trained in an experimental paradigm um, exist, then you infer that the variable in which you intervened is implicated in, in the production of the behavioral effects. Okay? And the dominant understanding of explanation in this area of neuroscience and the philosophical kind of explanation is mechanistic explanation. So it's supposed that explanations in neuroscience, or it has been argued, that explanations in neuroscience are multi-level. We can think of this um, rat who's been placed in a Morris water maze, which is an experimental paradigm um, to study for example, spatial memory. Um, this animal has a hippocampus. Inside that hippocampus are place cells, which purportedly generate a spatial map. This spatial map comes about by virtue of neurons um, in the hippocampus that are, um, in which synaptic plasticity changes in synaptic strength occur that underlie learning and memory. And these changes are mediated by activation of the NMDA receptor. Um, which has been shown to be important for learning and memory um, and in a variety of um, systems in the brain. So the basic idea is that what neuroscientists strive for are these multi-level explanations where they identify at different levels of organization um, what's productive of the <coughs> phenomena of interest. And developing mechanistic explanations, um, given, given the nature of these explanations, it requires contributions from experiments from the same and different areas of neuroscience. So it's going to involve collaboration, um, or data, it involves data integration. I'm going to talk more about this as I go. So how do cognitive neurobiologists make progress towards identifying the mechanisms of cognitive functions and dysfunctions? I've um, identified the basic investigative strategy, but um, this is going back, and, and much of the work that I'm presenting in this talk are things that I've been working on for quite a while. So one way to think about experimentation in neuroscience is as a process, which I like to refer to just as the experimental process. And essentially it begins with an empirical question about a phenomenon of interest. The investigator then goes into the laboratory and um, designs an experiment with an adjoining protocol. They select an experimental paradigm in order to produce a specific form of learning memory. And then they implement and instantiate that design over multiple trials, adhering closely to the protocol. Right? And so, for example, if you ask the question, do NMDA receptors in the hippocampus play a role in spatial memory, you'll design a task in order to test that um, possibility. And ultimately, if your experiment is reliable, and reliability is the first desideratum on the experimental process, 
the data, data protection process in your lab um, will yield a set of data that discriminates one hypothesis from a set of competing hypotheses about the effect under study in the laboratory. When I think of reliability, I think of it as applying to the data production process. You ultimately want that process to be, um, in Deborah Mayo's words, as severe as possible. You would like it to be the case that you control for the relevant confounding variables. Um, that you don't uh, end up um, taking a or you don't end up with data that adjudicates the wrong, an incorrect hypothesis, right? But granted, we're fallible, and sometimes as scientists, reliability isn't achieved, and we have to go back to the drawing, the drawing board. But that's the first desideratum on the experimental process. Another desideratum is construct validity. Um, you basically. <coughs> Construct validity states that the experimental paradigm should measure the cognitive capacity that the investigator intends it to measure. A construct um, is a postulated attribute or capacity of an organism. Examples include working memory, attention, face recognition, spatial memory. Constructs originate with a vague concept which we associate with certain observations. The vague concept serves as a basis for theory building and experimental task in paradigm design and construction. And experimental paradigms or tasks, I'm using those interchangeably, may have anywhere from a low to a high degree of construct validity. The higher the degree of construct validity, the closer the match between the effect under study in the lab um, and um, the phenomenon designated by the construct. And achieving construct validity is considered to be an iterative process. Um, essentially, when an investigator is in the laboratory, he or she will ask the question, which instances of stable regularities in the world should be grouped under that construct? Um, which investigative strategies will yield instances of it in the laboratory? Then ideally, the investigator asks, are these investigative strategies adequate or should we potentially modify them? And then it may be that given the results that are obtained, um, the investigators will decide to um, modify um, the construct. Okay, so those are two desiderata. Next desiderata is, is rep replicability or replication, which um, has come up quite a bit, um, obviously, in the past uh, day. So replication, um, as I'm understanding it, is doing the same experiment again. The replicator's procedures are intended to be very close to the originators. This is Nancy Cartwright interpreting um, Alan Franklin and Harry Collins um, understanding of replication. You only have some license to think, Cartwright claims, that you're seeing the phenomenon itself with the instrument just so long as you have this minimal kind of repeatability. And what we're after here with repeatability is a general phenomenon, that the instrument will produce the same results no matter where it's applied, it should give us the same results on different samples, and when it does not, your hypothesis for the instrument must be faulted. And the advantage of replication, according to Cartwright, is that it provides a kind of epistemological division of labor. It's, a, it's hard to get a good observational design, and it seems as if the team um, that sets up the design in the first place should get the machine running smoothly before the discipline has to come to grips with the ultimate question of how good the design is for finding out what it is supposed to. And I quote her there because all of these quotes are relevant to the case studies that I'm going to, um, to talk about. Um, and her words say it better than I could. Um, another epistemic desideratum is reproducibility. Um, it's important for investigators to develop an awareness of the kinds of errors to which the experimental techniques that they use are subject. Um, and this might be difficult to do within the confines of a single experiment especially when one aims to establish a causal claim about a causally complex system. In such instances, the relevant questions become, what is the right approach for getting a handle on the errors of the technique if there are any? And one answer is to compare the results of the method to other methods where the error characteristics are known or at least better known. Cartwright claims that reproducibility is a guard against error in our instruments, but that it's not necessary. Um, the more secure we are in our instruments, the less there is a need for it. In other words, the greater the reliability of our instruments, the less necessary it is. Okay. So these are the four components of the conceptual framework. And um, these aren't the only concepts that are important to knowledge production in science, but they'll serve my purposes in the next two sections. So I want to consider um, two case studies. The first case study I want to consider is the Morris Water Maze, which is a case that I looked at in a paper um, and pretty <laughs> fairly thoroughly in 2010, and I've talked about it in, in my other work. So to give you a brief historical background, 
Um, Morris developed and implemented the first water maze in 1981. His aim was to determine if rodents could learn to navigate to a hidden target on the basis of distal rather than local cues. This form of learning was originally referred to as place learning by psychologist Edward Tolman. The idea was that rats form a flexible cognitive map of distal spatial cues and their arrangement in relationship to a hidden target. And by the 1970s, there was accumulating evidence regarding the role of the hippocampus and hippocampal place cells um, that was consistent with the idea that rats form a cognitive map, but there were no mazes at the time that solved the local cue problem. So just to explain this, um, so at the time, maps were being run in mazes like this, where there were lots of local cues to which they could attend. For example, corners of the maze, and potentially smells, and how things looked in certain places. Um, they could also, um, they were responding, so they might be forming connections between stimulus response associations. So there might have been stimulus response associations being formed, or stimulus stimulus associations being formed, which allowed them to, to become better able to navigate to this hidden food box. Um, but the problem was that in, in experiments like this, Tolman thought that they developed a cognitive map of their environment. That was his hypothesis. But there was no, ex this experiment wouldn't adjudicate between that hypothesis and the other competing hypotheses. Um, so it was possible that, you know, basically the data that you derive at um, wouldn't adjudicate among them. So Morris thought, can we design a maze which will eliminate all local cues so that the rodents are only paying attention to the distal cues? So he designed the Morris water maze. Essentially what the Morris water maze is is a circular pour, pool <laughs> that's filled with water that's dyed opaque. And there's a hidden platform that's placed in one of the quadrants of the pool. Um, and then there are distal cues outside of the pool. And this hidden, this platform is hidden so that when the rodent is placed into the maze at one of the cardinal coordinates, it doesn't see the hidden platform and has to swim around to find it. Um, and what Morris found running eight rats um, in the Morris water maze in, in 1981 <coughs> was that over a series of trials, and we've got trial number on the x-axis and latency on the y-axis. Latency is just the amount of time it takes for the road to find the hidden platform. There's a decrease in escape latency over eight trials. Um, and what you also find is that after rats have been put in the maze um, multiple times, um, they'll beeline, they'll start beelining to that hidden target. So, how, what were Morris's interpretive conclusions on the basis of the water maze? Um, rodents seem to be able to find the platform on the basis of distal cues, and they thus exhibit the cognitive function of place learning, insofar as they exhibit decreases in escape latency, improvement in the directionality of the swim path, and they actually, though I didn't show the results, spend more time in the quadrant of the pool in which the hidden platform was located when they're placed back in. Um, however, Morris admitted that the results provided no definitive evidence that the processes underlying the formation of a map or its use in behavior are distinct from those processes explored in traditional studies of associated learning. So Morris published the protocol for the maze in 1984, and three years after his original study, this was three years after his original study was published. And as the paradigm could be used to produce replicable behavioral effects, the water maze had rapid uptake in cognitive neurobiology where investigators wanted behavioral paradigms that could be used to link hippocampal activity to behavior and to study forms of learning more complex than classical and operant conditioning. And that was the point he was aiming for, um, looking at something that was a more complex form of learning. Um, but there are certain problems, there are tensions when you try to um, look at more complex phenomena um, as opposed to phenomena that you can better subject to control. Um, by 2001, though, over 2,000 papers using the water maze had been published, and a major finding um, in cognitive neurobiology 11 years after the first publication was the, the, N, the N methyl D aspartate receptor, and I had shown you this figure before, um, is necessary for um, learning in the water maze. If you block the NMDA receptor um, with APV, um, which, which um, blocks its activity, rats do not learn the location of the hidden platform, 
Um, therefore, the conclusion on the basis of this study was the NMDA receptor is causally implicated in spatial memory. Now, what you notice is that during the 30-year time span after the uh, maze was first introduced, the phenomenon under study in the water maze, the term that's used to refer to it oscillates. So Morris originally started out by calling it place learning, but clearly he hadn't individuated place learning in the original experiment. Um, in later experiments, he referred to it as place navigation, then to spatial learning, then to spatial memory. And other investigators who were using the, the paradigm were referring to it as spatial navigation, water maze navigation, and finally, water maze performance, which doesn't look like a cognitive function at all and is not something that we're particularly interested in. Um, <laughs> so, a host of options were also put forward to capture the phenomena under study um, in, in uh, the water maze. Um, and for example, people, people said, look, there's different kinds of information that the rats may be learning. They're learning to swim towards a platform, to swim away from the sidewalls, that escape is possible. There are all these different forms of learning that may be involved. There are a variety of different navigational strategies. And there are a variety of different cognitive functions that may be operative in the water maze. So what happened when we think about the conceptual tools? Well, although Morris had sought to develop a reliable test to adjudicate between these competing hypotheses, the paradigm was not reliable for individuating place learning in the first place. Um, although the rats do find the hidden platform, for this to be place learning by definition, rats trained in the water maze would have to be learning the location of the hidden platform exclusively by means of the distal cues and the experiment doesn't establish this. We don't know precisely what rats have learned and what <coughs> cue or arrangement of cues they're using to locate within the platform. And when we stop to consider what goes on within a cross and between trials in the water maze, we've got more than one type of information <coughs> being learned, more than one sort of change in behavior being exhibited, and more than one cognitive function being involved. Um, so the paradigm does not measure what it was originally intended to measure. Moreover, at least in cognitive neurobiology, um, little work was done to sort out what form of learning is under study in the maze. Um, so, of course, Morris did recognize um, that there were problems with the maze. Um, in a 1995 um, paper, he tried to sort out, in collaboration with David Bannerman, who's a behavioral neuroscientist, what was under study in the water maze. And their research study begins with the, find, the original finding that the NMDA receptor is necessary for um, spatial learning in the water maze that was established in 1992. And so they begin this um, research study by doing the classic intervention experiment where they block the NMDA receptor and they find that in animals in which the NMDA receptor is blocked, um, compared to control rats, those rats don't exhibit escape they don't exhibit a decrease in escape latency nor spatial bias. And so this just reconfirmed the earlier findings. But then they decided to ask, why don't rats um, with the NMDA receptor blocked exhibit a decrease in escape latency or learn the location of the hidden platform? So they don't stop at the simple claim that the NMDA receptor is necessary for spatial learning and memory because they're interested in raising the question of why APV rats compared to controls do not learn the location of the hidden platform. They instead ask, is the NMDA receptor, is NMDA receptor activation necessary for spatial learning or non-spatial learning? For learning that there is a platform or for learning that the platform offers refuge. And so they run um, an experiment called the upstairs downstairs water maze where they pre-train rats on a downstairs water maze and then they inject, um, or then they deliver APV, they administer, um, they administer APV and then they train the rats on an upstairs maze and what they find is that the rats following pre-training in the downstairs maze actually do exhibit a decrease in escape latency in the second maze, much like control rats. And so they interpret that this, is, this finding um, to support the idea that NMDA receptors are not necessary for spatial learning um, since APV rats exhibit decreases in escape latency in the upstairs maze. <coughs> Um, and remember that the expected finding of NMDA receptor activation is necessary for spatial learning is that the APV rats will not learn the location of the hidden platform in the upstairs maze, but they do indeed learn. So then they ask the follow-up question. If the NMDA receptors are not necessary for spatial learning, is the hippocampus, where those NMDA receptors are located, necessary for spatial learning? 
So then they run the upstairs downstairs maze again, but this time they lesion the hippocampus after they train the rodents in the um, downstairs maze. And what they find is that the hippocampal lesion rats um, don't um, learn, don't exhibit the decrease in escape latency on the upstairs maze. So they interpret this finding as supporting the idea that the NMDA receptors must be involved in non, the non-spatial procedural learning of the task rather than in spatial learning. Because if the NMDA receptors were involved in spatial learning, then APB rats would not have learned in the second experiment. And given that hippocampal lesion rats do not learn, it must be that in the original condition of the maze, disruption of NMDA receptors is involved in another part of the learning task. So they run a fourth experiment in which they pre-train pre rats in a, in a Morris water maze with curtains around the pool and with the, um, with the hidden platform moving from quadrant to quadrant across trials. So they pre-train uh, rodents in this um, task. And then they, um, they think they're essentially minimizing the opportunity for spatial learning. And then they administer APV to block the NMDA receptor and put these rats in the upstairs maze. And what they find is that there's no significant decrease in escape latency or spatial bias during the probe trials in the APV rats, but these rats performed better than APV rats in experiment one that were given no pre-training of either type. Okay, so they conclude that the pattern of results indicates the importance of recognizing that the procedural simplicity of the water maze task belies its underlying psychological complexity Several potentially dissociable learning processes are involved, possibly depending on the interaction of different cerebral circuits. My conclusions on the basis of this case are as follows. As I said, it wasn't reliable in the first place for adjudicating between competing, competing hypotheses sorry, about the role of specific causal variables in a specific cognitive function. The replicability of behavioral effects alone did not ensure the reliability for adjudicating among competing hypotheses about the role of specific neural mechanisms in the production of a specific cognitive function. Only as investigators begin to worry about construct validity do they attempt to design experiments that better tease apart what function is under study in the water maze and which mechanisms are involved in which functions. And there's a growing recognition in cognitive neurobiology that something like this kind of analysis is required to advance the field. There's a publication um, in Neuron in 2017 um, by Krakow and colleagues where they argue that what we need when we design experimental tasks are precise hypotheses articulated in an a priori conceptual framework, careful task design, and collection of behavioral data. Um, and I've argued that you need to look, you need to take as an investigator different perspectives when you're looking at or trying to understand what's occurring um, in tasks like the Morris water maze. And this may be indeed, this may indeed mean that you think about the organism's mental states and the different cognitive functions as well as try to tease apart um, what you are determining in their behavior. Okay. So <laughs> Could you use the uh, speaker, the microphone? I guess I was asking whether any of this is a problem. Uh, isn't this the normal way that science progresses? They start off with some vague and simplistic approach, and then as the years go by, um, people get more refined hypotheses and ideas, and they test them in different ways. In fact, in fact, that's what Cartwright um, said. I mean that you know. <coughs> You, first you establish replicability, and then the field figures out what you're actually trying to detect with the measurement device. So, <coughs> sure, could it be better facilitated? Could it be that there could be more interaction between different scientists coming from different fields to kind of move things along more quickly? Um, I guess that's the, that's the question. So. Um, okay, so, or that's one of them anyway. <laughs> um, we can talk about it more during the break. So, for my second, basically, in looking at the Morris water maze, um, you know, that case study represents sort of one part of the story about how cumulative knowledge um, occurs in neuroscience, right? 
In that case, we're uncertain what psychological function is under study, and we don't know how to classify the observed behaviors, but we have replicability. Um, in this next case study, I want to consider the causal intervention side of things more explicitly. Um, and my focus is on intervention experiments that aim to establish causal claims that link alterations in brain activity to changes in behavior under study in an experimental paradigm. So if we consider um, prior to 2005, which is when optogenetic techniques arrived on scene in neuroscience, there were a number of different intervention techniques that neuroscientists could use that had certain pros and cons. Um, they, for example, they could lesion um, a specific brain area of interest and determine um, its effect on behavior. Um, and prior to more advanced methods, um, this offered a good approach for intervention. But there were obvious cons, um, namely recovery of function, um, the brain is plastic, um, you can't really regard an animal that has a part removed as simply a normal animal with a part removed. Um, another option for intervention techniques were brain cannulas, which involved less damage than lesioning. Um, and allow for the direct application of an agonist or antagonist into an area um, of the brain to block activity um, or enhance it. Um, and these are, this procedure is often combined with post-mortem analysis of cannula placements so that the investigator knows where the drug actually went in, into the brain. But one of the problems with cannulas um, are that um, the drug will sometimes diffuse, diffuse beyond the area in which the cannula is placed, and you can damage um, surrounding areas of the brain in which the cannula is inserted. A final option uh, are gene knockout techniques, um, which are less damaging than lesioning or cannula insertion. But you can't really regard an animal with a gene knocked out as simply a normal animal with a gene knocked out. Um, <laughs> just a part. Um, animals differ from normal, these gene knockouts often differ, differ from um, normal animals or control animals in numerous other ways. Um, and it's important to um, de determine the phenotype of, of these animals to determine what kinds of problems they have. Um, so when optogenetics came on scene in 2005, and it was first introduced by Dizeroff and Boyden in Nature Neuroscience, um, and since that time, over 2,500 studies have been published using the technique. Um, I think it's a bit more than that, but I, I didn't, um, anyway, it's definitely over 2,500. Uh, how do optogenetic techniques work? In simple terms, scientists extract a gene um, from algae that codes for light-sensitive ion channels. That DNA is then inserted into neurons in the brain, and then it can be activated, basically turned on, by light. Um, and the idea, basic, and this is in very basic terms, is that you can turn these neuronal populations that have um, the, the um, opsin gene in them um, by, um, you can activate neurons and inactivate them simply by flip, flipping a light on and off. Um, and so optogenetics has been described as allowing unprecedented causal control over neurons. Um, Thomas Hitzel, for example, in 2015 says it brings neuroscience closer to causality because optogenetics all allows us to turn on and off, turn off function with cell-specific millisecond precision. We can begin to identify the activity that is both necessary and sufficient to link neural function to behavior. Um, and Michael Hauser says it's completely changed how we do experiments in satellite systems neuroscience. It has provided us with powerful tools for making causal links between elements of neural circuits and behavior, and that we can prove both necessity by inactivating neuronal populations and sufficiency by activating the same neurons. And John Bickle has talked about the fact that real revolutions in neuroscience involve developments of techniques like optogenetics, um, and that you don't really need to have any theory attached to that or any kind of theoretical framework. Um, it's not important. But a 2015 study from Ben Solgachki's group at Harvard um, supports the importance of reproducibility when the error characteristics of an intervention technique that's new are not known. Um, so to give you some brief background, um, Ovechki and colleagues um, wanted to determine the role of the primary four-limb motor cortex in rats in motor learning. So he and his team trained rats in a motor task. And basically the rats were required to press a lever twice in close succession um, with a delay between uh, of 700 milliseconds. 
and then they would receive a water cooler. Um, after, after rats reached asymptotic performance on the task, the investigators infused a GABA agonist, muscimol, into the primary forelimb motor cortex um, in order to inhibit neural activity in this region and determine the impact on task performance. One animal's P, um, prefrontal motor cortex was damaged, or primary forelimb motor cortex, pardon me, was damaged while administering the drug. So they decided to just lesion it. And to their surprise, compared to rats that had been administered muscimol and who could no longer perform the task, the lesioned rat was able to perform the task despite receiving no subsequent training in the paradigm after lesioning. So there was no possibility, they claimed, for experience dependent plasticity. So they found this interesting and they did a follow-up study. And this consisted of three experiments. In the first experiment, they trained animals on that same task. And then they inactivated the primary forelimb motor, motor cortex after learning by injecting um, a GABA agonist um, to turn on inhibition in this region. And they found that there were severe deficits in skill execution with marked drops in performance and disrupted paw kinematics. I'll, I'll show you the the data in just a moment. Um, how many did oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, in the second experiment, they lesioned the motor cortex. Um, and then they tested the animals five to 10 days um, after lesioning. Um, and they, they found that immediately after these lesions, the animals exhibited severe deficits, but within five to 10 days after lesioning, full recovery of initially affected behaviors um, without retaining retraining return. Um, in the third experiment, they optogen optogenetically activated the motor cortex. Um, and they found that, um, and, and basically they stimulated optogenetically the primary forelimb motor cortex contralateral to the dominant paw that the animals were using to press the lever after they had reached asymptotic performance on the task. And what they found was there were severe deficits in skill execution with marked drops in performance and disrupted paw kinematics. And so here's, here are the results. Um, on basically what they're showing you, you in, or to, to explain, um, they're looking at both the horizontal um, paw, traje the trajectory of the paw horizontally and vertically. Um, and what they see um, when they inject um, muscimol is that the motor cortex plays no causal role in, in that form of learning. When they lesion the area, the motor cortex, or sorry, the motor cortex plays a causal role. In the second case, the motor cortex plays no causal role in the case of lesioning. And when the motor cortex, um, basically when they use optogenetic techniques, they see that the motor cortex plays no causal role. To sum this up, essentially what they're finding is that when they do an acute manipulation, right, and they silence this, they silence the primary forelimb motor cortex just um, briefly, it disrupts um, learning, right? It disrupts the normal, well, it disrupts the performance of the task. But when they lesion, the rats show that they can still perform the task. And so then the question becomes, well, if we want to know the function of a specific area of the brain, do we go with the results from an acute manipulation that only knocks the area out momentarily and then claim that that gives us a causal relationship, or if we are interested in the permanent loss of that area, is that the right thing to look at to determine the causal role of that particular um, brain area? Um, and they showed this not only in the rodent, but they also looked at um, zebra finches. Um, they allowed juvenile zebra finches to learn to produce courtship songs by memorizing and vocally mimicking adult zebra finches. Then they disrupted excitatory projections to um, the hyperstriatum vars pars caudalis, which is here in the figure, um, which is an essential component of, of um, song learning. And they tried to determine the impact on learned vocalizations. And what they discovered, they couldn't use optogenetic techniques here, but what they discovered was temporarily um, turning off or temporarily inactivating the sensory motor nucleus using muscimol and zebra finches negatively impacted their songs, whereas permanent lesions did not. So how do you explain these discrepant findings? I mean, basically they claim that 
Acute manipulations may have off-target effects, which may jeopardize the ability to use those manipulations to establish causality, right? So due to the fact that neural circuits are massive, massively interconnected and activity introduced at a single locus likely spreads to other connected circuits, which do not play a role in the production of the behavior of interest under normal conditions, but do under conditions of acute manipulation, perturbations in one node send ripples downstream through the system, compromising the capacity of downstream circuits to perform computations on other inputs or generate pattern activation from internal dynamics. Um, and in this paper, they designed a computational network to model this. What I think this case study shows, and, um, and it, it did um, generate some interest uh, in the, in, among neuroscientists, both um, Thomas Sudoff and um, Pratt and Prather published um, responses to this research study. But I think it, it shows the importance of trying to reproduce results using multiple intervention techniques for establishing causal points. Um, such methodological pluralism places different intervention experiments in check um, when comparing newer techniques with techniques that have known error characteristics. Um, it's a better way to promote the growth of knowledge rather than relying on any one technique alone. Now, I showed this result before, and actually Rich said um, uh, that uh, you know it was a fortuitous uh, occurrence that they discovered that um, you know that, that there was a difference between these between lesions and um, acute manipulations. Even still, I think it, it does um, demonstrate the importance of, of comparing different techniques um, to get a better understanding of, of um, the system. OK, so um, what about the importance of replicability, which was the final um, criteria or desiderata that I talked about? So the morris watermaze case stresses the importance of reliability and construct validity and suggests that replicability of behavioral effects alone is insufficient for identifying the mechanisms of cognitive functions. And the optogenetics case seems to reveal the importance of testing causal hypotheses using multiple methods, especially in cases of uncertainty with respect to the reliability of techniques. But what about the importance of replicability or replication in cognitive neurobiology? Um, in a 2009 paper, I argued that investigators in neurobiology um, have some freedom to select whichever experimental paradigm they deem appropriate for addressing their empir empirical questions, and that in fact, even in instances in which investigators were using the same paradigm to investigate a given cognitive function, but varying the protocol that was associated with it, in other words, varying specific task parameters, it was an open question whether they were investigating the mechanisms of the same phenomenon or different phenomena. And I, as long as that question was open, I argued, there's a problem for integrating results across these different experiments, in part because differences in protocols may translate into differences in mechanisms. And in a recent paper, I'm more explicit that I think explanatory integration of the kind um, that um, mechanistic explanations are thought to require requires that the constructs that are, um, that are designating um, phenomena that are under study um, in experimental paradigms must be stable. So I think there's a problem with progress on this picture, that there's basically a, a roadblock to progress. Um, and I think one of the answers that I think has been put forward to respond to this is replication, right? So, um, does responding to this issue, this multiplicity, warrant some degree of standardization of experimental protocols across research groups? In other words, does it require an emphasis on replication? Um, if investigators use the same experimental paradigm and obtain the same behavioral results, there are better grounds for thinking that when they intervene in different variables across different laboratory contexts using that same paradigm, their results can be integrated into a causal story of the mechanisms operative in the production of the same behavioral effects. However, it's important to remember that more than replicability is going to be important. As the morris watermaze case establishes, we need reliability and construct validity too. We need to know what function they're producing, detecting, and measuring. And we also do not want to block progress by promoting standardization of methods at the cost of promoting creativity to develop novel and potentially superior investigative approaches. And this is something that Ina Atmazova has um, responded to my claim that we need some form of standardization. And in the 2014 paper, I acknowledged that um, you know, there, there are obviously problems with standardization. <laughs> um, 
but I think it's part of, part of um, it, at least there's good grounds for thinking that some investigators think that it is what we need. Um, so the con my conclusion of this third part is that the recipe for cumulative knowledge in cognitive neurobiology, I think, in light of these case studies, involves a variety of important ingredients. Um, and, 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 and how are neuroscientists supposed to ring all the right epistemic bells? That's the question. Um, ringing all the right epistemic bells is not going to happen in the context of a single research study or even in the context of a single research group. Rather, it requires an unprecedented amount of coordination among individual scientists and across research groups. And to some extent, conceptual and methodological pluralism in cognitive neurobiology historically has been rampant and unfettered, which I think is not conducive to progress, which is why I've suggested that what we need is coordinated pluralism. Um, so coordinated pluralism isn't unfettered. It's investigators working together, um, trying to strike the right balance between methodological pluralism and um, standardization of experimental methods while ensuring that various epistemic desiderata are being realized. And I think that you see something like this kind of coordination or coordinated pluralism at the heart of recent, recent initiatives sponsored by the US National Institutes for Mental Health, including the Cognitive Neuroscience Research to Improve Cognition and Schizophrenia Initiative and the Research Domain Criteria Project. Now, I'm not saying that these are perfect initiatives and they don't have maybe some problems, but at least one of the beliefs of investigators um, working um, under the, um, yeah, working within these uh, initiatives is that we do need to agree on how to define our constructs that designate cognitive functions. We do need to agree on which experimental paradigms can be used to um, individuate them, and ultimately what we want are um, mechanistic explanations that are multi-level that allow us, and we want to be able to integrate results across different experiments. And I think that this kind of coordinated pluralism is also at the heart of practices of labs like the Transla Translational Cognitive Neuroscience Lab here at Western. Um, um, and Lisa Succeda and Tim Bussey have, have kindly allowed me to sit in on their lab meetings. Um, and I became interested in their lab, and particularly because I take it that they do have these kinds of concerns, and they are um, basically what they're, they're, the aim of, of some of their research um, is translational. So it goes beyond just worrying about um, some of the kinds of issues that arise with rodent experiments. They're interested in issues of external validity. How do you extrapolate from experiments on rodents to say something about um, human beings? and um, how do you look at cognitive dysfunction? How do you investigate cognitive dysfunctions in rodents and identify mechanisms that you can target to treat persons that have cognitive dysfunctions um, that are common in mental illnesses? And when your goals are translational, there are a lot more epistemic criteria that you need to consider. Um, you, you know, and, and, and across their research, if you look at the body of publications that have come out of their lab over the past 20 years, you see explicitly these kinds of concepts being used and the importance of um, realizing um, these concepts for the goals that they, they have in mind. Um, and to do this kind of work, they have, they've collaborated with multiple different teams of researchers. Um, they've engaged in multiple different kinds of experiments, some with the aim of ensuring reliability of these touchscreen cognitive tasks that they've developed others with ensuring the construct validity of the tasks, still others aimed with ensuring face validity um, and that and translational <coughs> construct and neurocognitive validity. I can talk about these um, during the Q&A if you have questions. There's also an overarching commitment across research teams to replicate and engage in reproducible and open science. And indeed, as I said, this is the kind of coordination you see over the 20 year, 20 year history um, since the rodent operant touchscreen chamber um, <coughs> has been introduced. Okay, so what are some of the open and unopen questions? I guess there are quite a few of them, and hopefully they'll come up during, during the Q&A. But is the incentive structure in science currently conducive to this kind of coordination that we see happening kind of in pockets in neuroscience? 
Um, I don't think it is currently. I think this kind of science is interdisciplinary, it's pluralistic, and it can be painstakingly slow. And the costs, economic and personal, may be prohibitive, especially for junior or unestablished researchers. And if the incentive structure continues to be unfavorable, um, as long as this kind of pluralism is practically impossible on a larger scale, you know, what's the way forward? And I think, um, you know, there's value in having detailed conceptual frameworks for thinking about experimentation in neuroscience and thinking about cumulative knowledge production. Some neuroscientists recognize the benefit of having um, such a framework. And once you have such a framework in place, while the need to coordinate practices and perspectives across researchers and research groups may be more salient, um, what you also have are basic building blocks for doing good and trustworthy science in the absence of infrastructure. And I think in that respect, you, you, you do the best that you can. Um, and without further ado, thank you. me wonder about something I think about a lot, which is, does progress in science occur better when you um, hit upon a standardized paradigm and then uh, explore it more and more and more in greater and greater detail and slight variance, uh, which certainly increases probability and replicability? Or do you uh, see progress in science occur more when you break out of standardized models and try new things in new directions? Well, so, so I certainly think the second is where most of the progress comes from. And the first increases replicability, but doesn't really, you know, help science move forward. Well, I, I think it depends on what your specific aims are, in part. And I don't think that there's one. I mean, I, I kind of say at the end, I don't think there's one right recipe, right? I mean, the rodent touchscreen operant chamber wouldn't have come into existence if they had been locked into studying using the paradigms that were currently available, right? So in some sense, the development of new paradigms requires that you have that kind of freedom. And and so, I mean, I there's, there's a, I think, a question out there about, well, is there sort of a division of labor? I mean, can we do both? Can we do some work doing, you know, the more, we'll engage some of our resources in replicating um, and, and 
engaged in these larger scale initiatives, but then we'll also do other things. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, I mean, that, that sort of the answer I, I would I mean, that is the answer I'm giving. <laughs> well, I'm not, I, I think you largely agree on this, but I, I, I would say we're, one way sort of maybe out of this in a way is that where standardization is valuable, it seems to me in science standardization arises. It should never be imposed. And I think one of the dangers around now is that there are attempts on many funding agencies and things like that to impose standardization. That I think is an extremely dangerous and essentially inhibiting idea. Standardization arises normally, I think, in the course of scientific experiments. It's accepted for a while and then thrown out and so forth. But So I, I'm not sure we should make an issue of it, is, is what I'm saying. I think it's there when it's needed. Okay, and but so, yeah, but in, in that respect then, for the goals that in certain areas, it seems to be something that is happening for that reason. And I guess, I mean, you're right. Funding agencies like those are encouraging it. But, but it sounds funny to say, but standardization ought to be temporary. Well, and okay. the thing is that when you look at the RDOC, when you look at some of these initiatives, they talk about these constructs as heuristics that are open to change as we discover more. And I think we, ha I mean, in some sense, I think we have to be open to that too, right? That it's possible that there are things that we we're fallible, and you know yeah. I think. <laughs> well, sorry. I have to go that this, far. Is, uh, this is this <laughs> is. I don't have to go that far. <laughs> sorry, it's something that I've recently come to terms with. <laughs> like, yeah, we're fallible. That's okay. <laughs> um, but but anyway, so I, I mean I think. Make a, a point to sort of follow on from that because I think one thing that's important. Is that on? Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that I think is important to acknowledge here is that neuroscience is inherently interdisciplinary, and when you're talking about um, these experiments, you're talking about very different levels of analysis. So um, often you have, and in fact, almost sort of 99 percent of the time, the person who is developing this sort of neurobiological manipulation has no knowledge of, of the intricacies of the behavior, and vice versa. And so I think that um, because of that, you often get people who are doing these very, uh, you know, developing optogenetics techniques, and all they do is they whack the mouse in a, in a, in a worse, worse water maze. They don't understand the, um, the, the sort of intricacies of that behavior. And so I think standardization is really important. Um, in part for that reason, because of that lack of expertise across the different levels. So, you know, unless you have people, behavior people, and you know, biological people working together, which, again, as you were saying before, isn't really encouraged by the incentive structure within science, then then knowing at least that you have your biological sort or psychological constructs worked out so that other people can use them is hugely important. No, thanks, thanks so much for that. I mean, I, I, I fully agree. Uh, just a small remark. Uh, so, if you speak of progress, uh, then uh, you have to specify what, the, what are the aims of science. And apparently, you think primarily at knowledge. But as I said yesterday, and it seems also to be your position, that is also so the, the contribution to technological development, especially when you are going to generalize towards human beings. And it is very important also for the funding and so on. So I, I agree with you that the standardization, of course, is very important if you want to, to develop so what, what I call experimental technology, so devices, medical uh, therapies, and so on, that might be uh, developed from them. So I agree with that. So. Thank, thank you. Double mics. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm definitely on the same page with you about the standardization protocol, but I'm just kind of curious, like how you would actually implement that. Like, what would, what, what does that look like to you? Would it be like a book where all these standardized protocols are available, or would it be more like, um, I don't know, say like an online database like Wikipedia, where researchers could just come in and like update and edit things and kind of have like a, a self-policing mechanism where things are kind of continually 
I mean, I, I guess I'm just curious what that resource looks like to you, kind of an idealized state. Well, I, I do want to say that the, the TCM lab did publish three sets of protocol papers in Nature Methods. And so in the, with the purpose of allowing investigators, I mean, they're very extensive and thorough for these for training rodents in different tasks in the touch screen operant chamber. So that is allowing for open reproducible science. I mean, that's, that's one of the aims and for standardization. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure, quick, well, I haven't given, yeah. That's, I think that's an ideal approach. <laughs> So that's, that's kind of the model that I'm trying to understand. But would this be specific to like just doing like rodent studies or would this be across like all branches of neuroscience and like science in general? Would that be kind of your complete vision of what it looks like? <laughs> I mean, I, my complete vision, I don't have any idea necessarily about what my complete vision on anything is, but um, um, I mean, I, I think, I, I think that's, I, when I in my papers I talk about different kinds of constructs that are at, that are being used that investigators aren't defining similarly um, and aren't studying in the same way and so I think it, it's not it doesn't just require that you do the publication it's going to require interaction among investigators as well you know I mean having the protocols out there is very important but there has to be some follow up um, and so. So, and, and should this be um, generalized to other constructs that are, are being studied that can't currently be studied in the rodent operant chamber? Um, but the, as I said, there are a lot of other things that need to be sorted out, right? I mean, it's not just let's, all, let's standardize everything because you also need to do all the work necessary to make certain that those are good approaches, right? So, um, and I'm surprised that you agree with me because yesterday you, you said, Oh, I really like multiplicity. And I, I well, thought, oh, he's gonna, he's gonna just ask you, you know, he's gonna say to me, God, standardization, no, but, well, but uh, I, so I'm surprised. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, I think, I think you need to have a balance. I think you need to have a foundational structure to like within which to organize that knowledge, but realize it's just a heuristic. It's just kind of a temporary framework to think about, but I think you need to like break out the boundaries of that also in order for science of progress. So I think you need both. all of these experiments, and it's generally unstated or stated somewhere deep in the method section, are performed in animals between 30 and 60 days old. 
which are considered adults because they're sexually mature at that age. That is, they can, they can reproduce. We all know that that has nothing to do with adulthood whatsoever. But, and indeed, these animals are still developing neurally. The reason that you use mice or rats at 30 to 60 days is you don't want to keep them any longer because they're expensive. But in point of fact, almost all of these results would be different if you used a mouse that was nine months old rather than one or two months old because of the plasticity that occurs in younger animals versus older animals. And so that's a virtually un unstated variable in all of these experiments. struck by the interesting relation between the talk you gave on the water maze example and the talk we heard on snake venom yesterday. It seemed very similar. Yeah, and I apologize that I didn't refer back. Um, and I don't know if you want to chime in about any of that. There's a lot that can be said, but just interesting that you know, we are reprising stuff that's been true of the way science developed hundreds of years ago. Right. There were various things I had meant to point out. You know what you like to. Do you want to? structure, but there's also people who are very 
wedded to how they do things, and they're they're rigid, and they're not interested in you know they're interested in the components of the house, not the house itself. You know they'll say things like that. And so you you know so it makes sense given, you know, and you can't just take a paradigm out of one place and and it's not clear what it measures and just import it somewhere else and so yeah I would think that I I, I mean I'm only I'm only thinking about this example but I mean I'm not, I don't know I mean there are other, there are other I'm sure there are other examples so yes <laughs> thank you for the question yes yes Richard one other sort of a, one other advance that I've seen in recent years really mentioned is a somewhat new way of bridging the gap between brain and behavior, which is using neural data to um, tune the parameters of cognitive models. I've seen this uh, starting to occur more and more, maybe this way of, way of the future. But in any event, I don't know if you have anything to say about uh, that approach to bridging that gap. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely certain the experiments that you're talking about. So, uh, but Well, basically, it's, there's a lot of cognitive models of that, or, co or other kinds of models which are reported at the behavioral <coughs> and cognitive level to explain the causal mechanisms and processes that are involved in various tasks without neural data. And then what we see recently is a number of people are starting to uh, you connect the parameters of those cognitive models to neural data in various ways. And there's a different approach. That was, that's the basic uh, in instances idea. Where, in instances where the tasks, the data that's being amalgamated is coming from different Well, there, there's two kinds of data. There's the uh, behavioral data, which oh. is where the models, cognitive and behavioral models come from. And there's the neural data associated the measurements that you make on the neural side at the time that this is going on and then trying to connect those two uh, directly with the model rather oh. than Plausibly, a plausible advance in the way that we're trying to bring.